Late in the year 1940, a Lyonnais industrialist, René Maurice Guetfossé, purchased a property in saint remy de provence the Mas Belle-Ile. Although business dealings were severely restricted by the Second World War, his intention was to ensure a direct supply of lavender, rosemary, and sage, aromatic plants that for him were raw materials in his chemical factory. The essential oils distilled in the Mas Belle-Ile were to be used in formulas for perfumes, ointments, and pharmaceutical and cosmetic preparations produced by his firm. Having spent all his working life promoting the cultivation and properties of lavender, René Maurice Guetfossé became a lavanda culturalist himself at the age of 60. In 1907, President of the Southeast Agrarian Union, Monsieur Fongalon, invited the Guetfossé brothers, chemists and perfumers in Lyon, to take an interest in the destiny of lavender growers in Haute-Provence. René Maurice, 26, went to Ventoux, Ferrassière, Manosque, Nyon, and Valréas. At the wheel of his fire-engine red, single-cylinder zebra car, he roamed vast stretches of wild lavender land, the so-called Bayassière. It was the start of a love story. And yet, he discovered harsh lands where gathering and distillation conditions were appalling. In this unwelcoming soil, poor harvests barely sufficed to meet the needs of day-to-day -day life. So our young engineer undertook a campaign of lectures to explain how to gather and distill rationally. His science was aimed at boosting essence production and increasing its market value. In line with Fongalon's wishes, the eventual aim was to pull small producers out of their destitution. Etablissement Get Fossé gained enough to grow their perfume business, establish their reputation, and make France independent vis-à-vis -vis England the traditional supplier of lavender essence. Get Fossé didn't just bring fine theories. First, he showed peasant farmers how to grow lavender, a wild plant in fact, in an artificial way. He encouraged the use of fertilizers. He then revamped the distilling equipment. He and his industrialist friend, Jean-Marie Vian, perfected the stills. He cultivated contacts at Dignifer, where buyers and producers from Grasse haggled over market prices of essences. He taught local pharmacists titration methods for ethers that enabled the selection of essences. He and Professor Lamotte, the tireless lavender defender, worked to set up a producer's syndicate on luc en dois In Barème, he bought the Schimmel factory, the first steam distillery. In 1916, still working with Vial, he organized a cooperative of lavender growers at Saud en Vaucluse, known as La Société de la Lavande Française. For 10 years, his campaign showed no sign of slowing down. Business was very profitable because just before the First World War, the market climbed from 14 to 48 francs a kilo. Output increased in similar proportions. The lavender growers' battle had been won, and the future of French lavender was assured. In 
In his discussions with Provençal farmers, Getfosse heard about some of Lavender's properties. They said that Lavender encouraged rapid healing when applied to wounds. Taken on a lump of sugar, it calmed stomach ills. While applied on children's swollen necks, it cured sore throats. Between 1910 and 1920, Getfosse was also acquiring in-depth knowledge about other aromatic plants. He visited rose gardens in Faisan, Villeurbanne, and Fenizieux, all just outside Lyon. He then went off to see others on the Riviera, in Sicily, and in Bulgaria. He and Vial invested in a rose essence factory in Golf Chouin. In Grasse, he scoured cultures of jasmine, tube roses, and hyacinths, and had conversations with the prestigious Chéris firm. He went to Algeria to seek geranium and orange essences. Elsewhere, he met with small farmers who grew mint, bergamot, and clary. Everywhere he went, he bemoaned over traditional, over-artisanal cultivation practices where science was still absent. Wishing to regulate his supplies of raw materials, he became involved in the business of various companies to obtain lemon essence, orange concentrates, jasmine, citronella, irises, rose essence, crystallized menthol, and so forth. The company made good contacts with Argentina, Japan, French West Africa, Indochina, and Madagascar. The Getfosse brothers, Abel, René, Maurice, and Robert, very quickly came up with an original way of propagating all these activities in favor of aromatic plants. They created Parfumerie Moderne, a journal of science and professional defense. The aim of this journal was to give support to the French perfumery business by addressing all the players. These included lavender growers, but also major industrialists in Grasse, agriculturalists, and equipment manufacturers. The brothers wrote up Getfosse laboratory research results in the journal. They added photo reports and advertised the firm's products, so much so that Parfumerie Moderne became a sort of a family album. The journal's ambiguity lay in the fact that it was both a corporate voice and a major in-house propaganda tool. Most of all, though, it was a masterstroke that instantly changed its publisher, Etablissement Getfosse, into a leading player in the scene. Numerous professionals eagerly awaited its appearance every month just as many others used to wait for Formulaire de Parfumerie, edited by René Maurice. This regular publishing effort gave the firm a boost in the markets that exceeded its actual industrial weight. Such strategic considerations were always mixed with a clear taste for exchanging and debating ideas. Year after year, issue after issue, and later book after book, Getfosse shared its research progress. The firm's scientific and technical library kept growing, reaching some 30 titles. Parfumerie Moderne quickly became an international success and was translated into several languages. 
it enabled the best of French know-how to be shared around the world. The downside of all this success was that production growth was limited to France. Once foreign producers had learned some secrets from this most modern of technical magazines, they were able to go ahead with their own development. This editorial paradox was a sign of the personality of René Maurice Gatfossé, a deeply patriotic man whose natural curiosity and business affairs took him outside the national scene. The campaign carried out by Parfumerie Mordéon to promote French lavande culture was more than just a success. It was also the sign of a deliberately social and progressive spirit. Through self-discipline, Gat Fossé was able to reform his liberal nature. His life thus took on large numbers of responsibilities. Wishing to encourage industrial and agricultural development in his region, he helped to found the AICA, a Lyon's Employers Association. Vice President for some 30 years, he succeeded Aimé Bernard as president from 1945 to 1950. Get Fossé was also, variously, president of the French Lavender Syndicate, founding member of the Lyon's Fairs Committee and the Rotary Club, vice president of the Rhone Perfumeries Employers Federation, director of the Galliani Blind Workshop School, regional technical education inspector, member of the Rodiana Archaeological Association and the Society of Comparative Pathology, as well as mayoral candidate at Saint-Rémy. Scribbled down in notebooks and school exercise books are formulas, sketches, debates and correspondence notes, outlines for novels, occasional deeper, more personal reflections, rhyming poems, and so on. Put end to end, these papers give a faithful rendering of the brainstorming activities of René Maurice Quetfossé. A new world, another world, my world, as he himself put it. It all bears witness to the fertility and the polymorphous curiosity of his mind. Quetfossé was interested in everything, especially everything new and technical. He spent time thinking about television and Wagner envisioned replacing highway bitumen with rubber. He read Freud and Shakespeare, wrote about relaxation therapy, and how to invent PowerPoint using the Lumiere Brothers cinema. While this multiplicity of interests shows an erudite universal mind, it should not be seen simply as a trait of his character. Every one of his thoughts, every piece of new inspiration, was in fact part of a system of global thinking, precisely based on the variety and the confrontation of different domains. Work on group psychology, skiing, or the scriptures constantly came along to stimulate or freshen formulations of chemical hypotheses. His perfumery, an art of subtle combinations, mirrored his intellectual curiosities. 
This profoundly intuitive way of thinking required total freedom, a refusal of conventional thinking, plus a dash of anti-conformity. All such features composed the get definition of wisdom. Self-fulfillment was quite rightly an early concern. As a child, little René drank two liters of strong tea a day to fortify his willpower, went on diets, took rigorous exercise, and sought supernatural powers. He studied psychology and teaching, history and the parasciences, ones he was later to call the forgotten techniques. He experimented. He drew up plans of imaginary devices. His sorcerer's apprentice temperament led him to reproduce experiments carried out by Professor Charcot at the Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital in Paris. He hypnotized his younger brother, Robert, an excellent subject for mediums, who vividly described details of events from the start of the century. One evening, Robert described the last hours lived by the crew of a submarine stranded 50 meters below. The future of René Maurice was decided for him by his father, Louis. Wanting to channel his son's creativity in a way that would help the family business, he ordered him to study chemistry. The young man thus entered the College of Sciences at the University of Lyon. He held long, passionate discussions about the future of chemistry with his colleagues, especially Paul Fish, whose father was to be a significant shareholder in the business during the 1920s. They were all convinced that chemistry would be the grande affair of the century. In 1902, while his elder brother, Abel, and his father, Lui, were running the business, young René Maurice, fresh out of university, was in charge of the get laboratory. July 25, 1910. René Maurice Gatfossé was injured in an explosion. With his hands and head severely burnt, he was soon stricken by gas gangrene. He was given the traditional treatment of picric acid, bandages, and rest, but to no avail. As a last resort, remembering the old time Provencal practices, he decided to apply essential oil of lavender to his infected wounds. The results were rapid and astounding. They ended by confirming his intuition. Lavender essence possesses true antiseptic and healing properties. Thus was born a conviction that Gat Fosse wasn't about to let go of and that he would fight for. The whole scientific and medical world would have to be convinced. That meant endless tenacity and patience, and more concretely, lots of articles and conferences, plus papers that constantly drove home his postulates. In 1917, he wrote The Culture and Industry of Aromatic Plants and Medicinal Plants from the Mountains with Lamotte. In 1919, Bactericide Properties of a Number of Essential Oils. In 1924, The Physiological Role of Perfumes in Collaboration with Tamisier. In 1925, Physiological Actions of Aromatic Solutions with Dully. In 1926, Therapeutic Value of Lavender Essence and Essences and Therapeutics. In 1927, rapid healing of wounds with essential oils. In 1932, therapeutic use of lavender essence, pine essence, and its bactericidal properties. In 1937, he published what was certainly the cornerstone of his work in therapeutics through essential oils, aromatherapy. This syncretic work went back over the previous experiments and publications.
Gatfa say coined for the occasion the neologism aromatherapy that was soon to definitively baptize this branch of medicine that he contributed to creating. Throughout all those years, he worked to build the authoritative reputation of aromatherapy and to ensure its influence. Gatfosse conducted the battle on two fronts, theoretically, through constant editorial work, and clinically, through the application of experimental research in hospitals. To be more convincing, he multiplied his partnerships with practitioners during the First World War with doctors Forg and Marchand. In the 20s, with pharmacist Tamizier and Dr. Dully, with whom he wrote a number of books. In the 30s, his son, Henri Marcel, himself a chemist who had joined the company in 1932, he implemented a highly beneficial rapprochement with Lyonnais physicians at the Antiquaire Hospital, Dr. Gatte and Dr. Jonquier. Working with Jonquier, Gatfosse wrote a number of books, including Biophysical Essays and Theory of Hair. For these physicians, our Lyonnais chemist formulated essential oil-based pharmaceutical preparations that were later prescribed for patients. These were various compositions and some found favor. Stoicone, a lavender essence from which the terpene has been removed, that is to say one that has been cleared of the toxic agents found in essential oils. And Salvol, an aromatic disinfectant developed by Getfosse during the 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic. Essences had previously not been used very much as antiseptics because their insolubility in water made them very difficult to use. But Getfosse managed to make salvol and stoicone soluble in water and miscible in fatty substances. Thanks to this innovation, essential oils could now be used in various forms, ointments, emulsions, and liquid solutions for injections or sprays. later in the 30s, new preparations based on other excipients would enable better dispersion of volatile elements. It was to be the hour of glory for sapolinol, a soapy mixture containing minute doses of selected essential oils. Many patients suffering from gangrene, scabies, or venereal diseases were cured. Getfosse carefully wrote up the results. Aromatherapy was the product of those years of prescriptions. Nineteen nineteen, the family had lost two sons, Abel and Robert, fallen for France. The economic situation was gloomy. The firm's finances were precarious, but René Maurice wanted to find the means to develop his intuitions and his research projects to give the firm a new lease on life. So he held a meeting with an assortment of Lyonnais financiers and industrialists with whom he founded the SFPA. La Société Française des Produits Aromatiques, formerly Établissement Getfosse et Fils. Getfosse at first held only 8% of the capital, but assumed the general management of the company. Activities were diversified, and new ranges of products were created synthetic perfumes, insecticides, veterinary bandages, and compositions for hygienic skin care. In 1930, the SFPA catalog listed 647 products. Successes, though, were unfortunately short-lived and profits generally very modest. The company didn't have the means to diversify in this way and was unable to drum up the sort of advertising budgets needed for general public products. Spending energy to overcome market gloom and satisfy shareholders was exhausting. Dialogue between the board of directors and the general manager was getting tougher and tougher. 
Get Fosse was getting to an age where he cared more and more about realizing his own personal dreams. As he weighed up these disagreements and his own aspirations, he remembered Plato's Atlantis. Valuing only virtue, they had little regard for earthly things. Financial success and business activities should not stifle the search for wisdom and the quest for truth. On the contrary, they should serve them. René Maurice Getfossé devoted time to his reading and the freedom essential to his scholarly work. In 1928, he confided his feelings to Pierre Argence, former publisher of Parfumerie Moderne, and Aimé Bernard, president of the company. Together they envisioned capital and sectoral restructuring of the SFPA that came into effect at the board meeting of February 27, 1930. To pay back part of its shares and bonds, the company quit the large land area in Villeurbanne with its rational organization and workers' houses and went back to the Gatfossé's original headquarters in Montchat, in nearby Lyon. The personnel was reduced, purchases restricted, and the company refocused its activities on its core skills, perfumery, pharmacy, and the veterinary sector. Thus it was that in 1930 the majority of the capital was once again held by the family, and the firm's position, though more modest, was stabilized. It was not until the post-war management of Henri Marcel that the SFPA would become établissement get fossé once again and stride into the industrial era. During recent study trips to the Greco-Roman site at Glanum, Gitfosse had discovered and fallen in love with the region. He wanted to acquire a property not too far away from Saint-Rémy-de-Provence. Gaston Duprat soon invited Gitfosse to join him in Saint-Rémy. There, a former sheep barn located on land that had now become the community garbage dump was up for sale in the Verdière district. Despite the dilapidated state of the building, and the hundreds of cubic meters of garbage surrounding it, René Maurice was captivated. Under the charm of that arid, rocky, and forbidding landscape, he was drawn to the idea of making a garden in the desert. The humble sheep barn put the final seal on his old love for Provence. A few months later, the board of directors endorsed the acquisition of an 8-hectare Provençal farm to grow and distill aromatic plants. The aim was to ensure a regular supply of raw materials for the company. With that in mind, he designed a botanical garden, and he built a distillery so as to process the garden's production on the spot. Getfosse scoured the region and drew inspiration from the local architecture. The tower as a Provençal character. And so the work started, bringing to life the plans he'd drawn up. Earthworks, laying out terraces and low walls in the garden, clearing garbage all around, revamping and renovating the inside of the old buildings to the south, building a new inner courtyard and a wing of outbuildings to the north. Nothing was forgotten. Now age 60, René Maurice Getfossé increased his comings and goings between Lyon, where he lived and worked, 
Vichy, where he went for spa treatment to strengthen his failing health, and Belleville. It was there in the farmhouse that he undertook and completed his works of fiction in the 1940s. The plot of one of them, Marc La Salienne, published in 1942, is opportunely situated in Provence. Gat Fosse worked for a number of years, studying regional prehistory and attending more and more archaeological digs on two sites that he particularly liked, La Roque Pertuse near Aix-en-Provence and Glanum, a stone's throw from Belle-Ile. In the albums he used to prepare his novels were notes and documents. He also archived scientific articles that interested him, along with correspondence exchanged with archaeologists, especially Henri Rolon. He compiled his own photographs, and he even made some dramatic reenactments. Marthe was the local folklore heroine that Gatfosse adopted and brought to life when the first Roman armies arrived in the region in the second century BC. This philosophical novel enabled Gatfosse to put life back into that ancestral Provence, whose survival he loved to talk about with the abandoned lavender growers of the beginning of the century. Other works followed this historical fresco. Wisdom Writings, Paradise Limited Company, and The Republic of Angels, while Eve, an essay on women's position in society, remained unpublished. In fact, there was but a single question behind all these works, the origin. Paradise Lost had been a veritable obsession that René Maurice Gatfosse had unceasingly re-examined and gone into depth for over 30 years. The birth of Adam in 1947 followed on from the 1919 Adam, the Tertiary Man. His whole life long, Gatfosse had tried to define the means, more material than transcendent, liable to bring humanity to Eden. Prehistoric archaeology, Greek and Mexican mythologies, not to mention linguistics, are just so many parts of his general arguments. The novel, Paradise Limited Company, is exemplary. Published during the dark years, it highlights the creation of a society whose raison d'etre is to redress the Earth's axis. Redressing the Earth, according to the mature, serious, balding hero, engineer Maurice Gattier, would automatically put an end to seasons and re-establish the original spring. The argument of Paradise Limited Company brings out the profoundly humanist nature of its author. It's up to humans, or to be more precise, an organized and determined community to restore Paradise Lost. In the 1940s, René Maurice Gatfosse prepared the second edition of Aromatherapy. New chapters were written, thereby necessitating a full revision of the original manuscript. The first part was concentrated on the pure constituents of essential oils, studying them from a physiochemical standpoint. Gatfosse exposed elements relative to extraction techniques, the oxidizing power of terpenes, and the oxidation-reduction phenomenon of aromatic constituents. The second therapeutic part relates clinical trials carried out in Lyonnais hospitals since 1937. Once again, it was a thoroughly documented compilation in which René Maurice included work done by various authors, which he attached to his own results. It was also an opportunity to turn the spotlight on research in the Gatfosse laboratory, carried out by his son-in-law, Emile Malheur, in aromatic agents, and his own son, Henri Marcel, in dermatology. Just as the Gatfosse book was being finalized, the Second World War ended. The war had invented antibiotics. Penicillin, or streptomycin, revolutionized the treatment of infections, 
abruptly sweeping away traditional clinical methods and other emerging therapies. Aromatherapy had been overshadowed. The second edition has yet to be published. It was to be a long time before antibiotics would lose some of their efficacy through overprescribing. And it would be a long time before interest in phytotherapy and alternative medicine would be revived and the properties of essences rediscovered. But aromatherapy has seen a new spring and with it the name of René Maurice Guetfossé. J'ai chanté, il y a de la joie, sans grande joie pourtant. J'entonnais donc un petit air à pleine voix, l'air fut étouffant. Désormais, quels seront donc les pauvres mots sur les chansons gays que pour vous on invente On osera placer et sans hésiter trop pour ne pas me tromper. Moi, voilà ce que je chante. Avec un ou deux petits hop là, hop là, si vous voulez savoir ce que mon cœur pense ce soir en chantant comme ça, c'est notre espoir. <musique> 